All right, so it's being live streamed. So we are now live. Let me, uh, there's some folks logging in. So there's some folks logging in now. Just uh, getting all the social media stuff going. All right. We have some folks coming in now. Got some, some more folks joining us. And then I'm um, going to hit record so that we can get the link. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcoming. Welcome. Welcome. Just, um, <clears throat> just giving an extra two, three minutes for um, as many folks to join. And then um, I'll go ahead with the opening and introduction. And then we'll, we'll kick off with um, the speakers, um, you know, giving an introduction of themselves, tell you a little bit about what they do, who they are. So you'll know exactly um, who will be on this panel this evening. Their bios are up on the, the event website. If you go to speakers, the full bio, the full bios are up there for each of the panelists this evening. So, um, They'll just give you a synopsis of, of um, their bio, and then you can always go to the event website, b2bconference.net, and, um, and, and you know, read the full bio if you have not done so already. So this will just, um, just give you an, an, uh, um, you know, an understanding of who's on the panel this evening. So just give it about another two minutes, and then we'll, we'll kick it off. Thank you. All right, good evening, good evening again. Good evening, everyone. My name is Austin Thompson and um, I am the principal consultant and CEO with Thompson Management Consulting. Uh, we are a uh, boutique consulting firm that works primarily with uh, startups, entrepreneurs in the early stage of the small business life cycle. Uh, that's usually from the seed stage to the startup stage, the growth stage, right before uh, the expansion stage of the, of the small business life cycle. And we provide business planning services, uh, research, business plan research, research to complete the business plans, marketing, operations, financial analysis, and budgeting, as well as coaching and mentoring. 
And um, the Entrepreneurship and Small Business Summit is now in its ninth year. Unfortunately, um, we're not an in-person event due to the COVID-19 pan uh, COVID pandemic. So um, in 2020, 2021, and this year, we have uh, been a, a virtual model. Uh, hopefully by 2023, we can get back to being an in-person event. And this way folks can hug and shake hands and look each other in the eye, just, just as I love to do it. You know, because I always say when you're building relationships, you got to remove the laptop and you got to remove the screen and get in front of people. You know, and that's, the, that's always the best way to build relationships. Uh, however, be that as it may, uh, temporarily, this is the mode of communication for us and the way that we can execute this, uh, this, this summit. Next year will be our 10th year. We're, we're, we're planning for a, a wonderful anniversary, so look out for that. And, um, you know, we're, we're just happy uh, to be here in the ninth year, you know, um, and, and, and to be consistent with the conference. So uh, thank you all very much. We, we could not have achieved this much success without you, the speakers, the panelists that we recruit, and also the attendees, all right? So um, welcome to the ninth annual Entrepreneurship and Small Business Summit. This will be the first of several virtual events that we will do throughout the year. Um, and tonight's, um, tonight's uh, discussion will center around celebrating the history and excellence uh, of Black entrepreneurship, all right? Um, we know that with a um, little over uh, 2 million black owned small businesses out of 30 million small businesses in the US, um, we do make a significant impact. And although we continue to be underserved as far as access to capital and resources to grow as we need to grow as a business, we're still making a significant impact uh, with over 300 billion in revenue. And um, you know, and, and doing what we need to do in order to contribute to the success of the American economy. So we have to take moments like this uh, to, to uh, shed the light and to, and to recognize the importance of our small business enterprises, our African-American small business enterprises, African-American women, Afro-Latinos, uh, African-American men, uh, our African-American veterans, and everyone um, who is of African heritage uh, uh, participating in the entrepreneurship space. So welcome, and, um, and we're gonna get started tonight. I am your host, as well as uh, the moderator on, for the panel, and um, I'm glad to have you all here this evening. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna do some, uh, some housekeeping. I just wanna be able to um, just um, let everybody know, please, Put your information in the chat. We want folks to, we, we, this, this is virtual, but we want folks to be in contact with one another. We want folks to build relationships with one another, right? So after the, 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 the panel discussion tonight, reach out, make connections, you know, and, and to see, you know, if there is any way you guys can collaborate and work together and, and build a good network among one another, right? Um, if you're not speaking, please keep your mic off. So this way we can reduce feedback and, and any, inf any interference um, that may occur. Um, you know, just, the, I always encourage, you know, uh, attendees, keep your cameras on. We wanna see you, you're all beautiful. We wanna see you. And um, it's a good way to help make a connection. So keep your cameras on and, and if, you, if you wish, if you can, um, that always enhances the communication. So we get to see folks, all right? And, um, and again, you know, just uh, make sure you leave all your contact information in the chat, all right? Um, why, why are we celebrating uh, this event? Like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's to shine a light and to recognize the significance of entrepreneur, uh, African-American entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. And we definitely want to make sure that we do that as well as, as um, you know, uh, for all the, the, the various groups that are, that are making a significant impact um, in, in our country. So at this time, what I'd like to do is to introduce our panel. And um, I have uh, Dr. St. Clair Gray, 
Uh, he is uh, a, a consultant, an independent consultant. Um, he is um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the theology space, um, personal development. And um, he, is, he is someone, I, I, whenever I ask him you know, and solicit him to help me uh, facilitate, he's never turned me down. And um, he's a, I consider him a great friend. And I just want him to take about, a, about 60 seconds, a minute, just to introduce himself so you'll know exactly um, who he is. Dr. Gray. Well, well first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me, Austin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join and participate in the summit. As Austin said, my name is Sinclair Gray. I am an independent consultant. I am currently a speaker business trainer and success coach. I currently work with entrepreneurs and helping them to tap into their inner strength for leadership, conflict resolution. And one of the things I also do, I specialize in, I help entrepreneurs in networking. I teach them how to network effectively so that they, they can move from just making a contact to establishing contracts. And one of the things I, do, I love doing, I love connecting people. Also, one of the things I'm also doing, I'm also pastoring a church in Alamo, Georgia. If many of you do not know where Alamo, Georgia is, it's about two and a half hours from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, very small area, food desert area. One of the things that I always like to do, uh, give a shout out that um, our church, we're the only church in the Wheeler County area that provides food to um, food distribution to over 200 families every other month. So we're one of the uh, first churches that uh, that continues to do that. We've partnered with the food bank. So it's all about connections. It's all about helping to build people up from the from from, from the inside out. So thank you so much, and I'm definitely looking forward to participating in this uh, this 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 spirited dialogue. It was good to see so many of my colleagues. Good to see so many familiar faces. So thank you once again, Austin. Yes, thank you. I, I should be thanking you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, a brother who I met uh, as a, as a co-facilitator with Operation Hope. And uh, we struck a good friendship. He's out in sunny, beautiful Hawaii, so I'm jealous. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he's a he's another great person to know. And um, and he's um, you know CEO, founder of the Via Business Consulting Group. And I'm just going to allow Jose Papi Via to tell you a little bit about who he is. Okay, well, thank you so much, Austin, and and also and also uh, con congratulations on uh, becoming a councilman. Uh, and as Austin said, I'm, I'm, my, my friends call me Papi, uh, Pop Papi Villa. I was born and raised in Harlem uh, and spent my ten, teen years in the, in the South Bronx. Then I, I joined the Air Force at 17, spent 23 years with the Air Force, uh, lived all over the world. Uh, my, my last assignment was in Hawaii. And when I got here, I said, wow, this is y'all can leave me right here. You know? So in 1986, I, 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 Hawaii became my home and I, I've been here ever since. Uh, my, my company focuses on working with for-profits and non-profits. On the for-profit side, we, we do all the certifications, the MBE, WBE, 8A, business plans. We've written over 150 business plans. On our non-profit side, we do grant writing. We do grant research. We create non-profits. Uh, and we're based in Hawaii, but we have, we have clients across, across the nation. Our whole thing, it's my, my, my wife and I, our whole mission is, is to, to encourage our, my black community, my Latino community, my native Hawaiian community, the Asian community saying, we are good enough to go out and get corporate contracts. We're good enough to get government contracts. On our nonprofits, we're good enough to get large grants. And that's what we try to teach them because many times our nonprofits and our small businesses feel kind of relegated uh, to a particular space in the market. And what we're about is saying, no, baby, you don't, you don't belong here. <laughs> you know, let's, you know, instead of fighting each other for the, 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 the crumbs that are left on the floor, let's get a seat at the table where the contracts are given out, where Disney gives out contracts and Walmart and Office Depot and Pepsi-Cola. That's where we need to be. So 
again, my friends call me Poppy, and I'm, I'm loving my life. And thank you again for this opportunity, Austin. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna let uh, David Ortiz know he can't use Poppy no more, man. You, you, there is <laughs> yeah, a yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to have a conversation with him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, uh, Jose. Really um, grateful to have you, and, and as well as well as the other panelists as valuable um, participants tonight. Uh, the next gentleman is uh, Mr. Lyndon Jackson. He runs Operation Hope and works with small business, uh, small business startups and those who are pursuing the opportunities to, to start a business. And uh, I was invited by Operation Hope and Mr. Jackson to be a facilitator. Um, I think it was a couple of times I, I spoke um, to his members um, and twice with uh, Jose Villa. So uh, Mr. Lyndon Jackson, thank you so much. And let him tell you a little bit about who he is and what he does. Your mic. Your mic. Sorry about that. I, I tend to have it on all the time so I forget when it's off. But I was just saying thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, um, Councilman Thompson. And um, <laughs> I remember when you were just speaking at my uh, entrepreneur training class. And uh, I think you and Poppy were both on the same class. Yeah. And um, I think that might have been how y'all met, but uh, it's just been a yeah. great relationship with you. I'm not going to take up much time, uh, although I've got many years to cover. But let's just <laughs> say I, um, you know, I, I was born in Jamaica, grew up in New York. I uh, moved out to Los Angeles after I graduated high school, uh, got into music. Then I moved to Atlanta and took the um, uh, commercial music and recording program at Georgia State University. I ended up working with one of the world's biggest record companies, CBS Records, which got bought by Sony Music. But I uh, basically uh, marketed the music for Columbia Records, Epic Records, Def Jam, Taboo, Portrait, a uh, long list of record labels. And then I got into um, when the Internet came and took my job away. Uh, but that's another story where record stores kind of vanished and record stores were my primary marketing uh, objective. So record stores started disappearing around the mid to late 90s. And uh, so did my job. So I got into um, audio visual work and started doing meeting support for major corporations from Microsoft. Um, Chick-fil-A, Home Depot. Uh, so when they had their meetings, I was uh, in charge of getting the equipment set up and operated and running it. And I worked with all, you know, small co companies as well as large companies um, doing that. And I also worked with another company that marketed uh, software for Microsoft. Uh, you know, we were Microsoft partner. So uh, then I was out of work due to COVID and uh, no more meetings were taking place. So I looked to, uh, you know, I saw a um, press release saying that Operation Hope and, and Shopify partnered to create 1 million black businesses by the year 2030. And this was really interesting to me because I hadn't heard of things like this to support black business before. Uh, so I inquired and found out that they were actually looking for some small business coaches. So I signed on to help out there. And I, it really turned into a blessing because I'm helping all kinds of people, not only with getting their small businesses up and running, but also with uh, credit and money management. Uh, my grant uh, is under the Enterprising Women of Color initiative and that's sponsored by the minority business development agency and so um, I, I just basically celebrated my first year with operation hope and i've got a former speak i got two former speakers from my class here and one of my recent clients on the panel as well so i feel right at home and with that said i'm available to help anybody get their business cranked up or ramped up and um, I'm helping a lot of people. We're doing a lot of major uh, work out there. And uh, I already put my information into the chat box. And with that, I'll move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, very extensive experience and background. 
um, with all of our speakers here. Next, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Ms. Ronique West. She is the Executive Director of the Greater Augusta Black Chamber of Commerce, um, a dynamic young lady uh, with whom I had the pleasure of meeting uh, two years ago in Augusta when I uh, registered to exhibit there. And um, we've built a really good friendship. And, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, just, you know, watching all the things that she's doing with the Greater Augusta Black Chamber and just knowing that entrepreneurs out in that area are in good hands. So, Ronique West. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for calling me young, first of all. <laughs> love it, love that, love that. <laughs> Appreciate it. You know, my daughter's 28, so I don't feel young sometimes. <laughs> but um, but for sure, let me uh, just introduce myself. So I'm actually the president and co-founder of the Great Gusta Black Chamber of Commerce. So right. we um, actually have the first viable Black Chamber in our area. We sit in the Augusta, Georgia area, based in Augusta, Georgia, but we cover 18 counties. So we actually cover counties throughout the state of Georgia and South Carolina. Um, so I'm all about, of course, supporting our black owned businesses, um, making sure they have the resources that we need. We uh, melt business community and government. That is our focus at um, the Great Augusta Black Chamber of Commerce, along with some other things. I also am a uh, sit on the board of the Buford Black Chamber of Commerce, which is one of the largest black chambers in the US. Um, so I also sit on that board and serve a, as an affiliate throughout the sub with the Southern Region Roundtable. That is, uh, we focus on the seven states that is commissioners, council members, senators, um, Black Chambers, um, NAACPs, you name it, we really are focused on making sure initiatives, innovative initiatives that really will work for our community and our business owners um, are put in place throughout the state. So I consider myself a philanthropist um, at the end of the day, but I'm also a business consultant. So um, same, a lot of background like everybody else, um, but I had a huge background in corporate America about 15 years. So I did everything from uh, training to leadership to Six Sigma, project management, implementation, payroll, um, wrote a lot of business plans and all those good things, but now I'm all focused on building the things that we need for our community to make sure we can uh, manage all the transitions we'll go through, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ronique. Thank you so much. And uh, next, and certainly not least, right, uh, we have Mr. Ricardo Beres. Uh, he is an ambassador with the Atlanta Black Chambers, and um, you know the Atlanta Black Chambers uh, reached out to me several times to do business plan presentations for their group. Uh, just as I've done with other organizations, I'm always pleased to do anything um, that the Atlanta Black Chambers have asked me to do to facilitate. And I'm just so happy that they have representation here this evening in Mr. Ricardo Barris, and I'll allow him, you know, to to you know just introduce himself. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, uh, Austin. And um, congratulations, of course, um, are in order for you. I, I bring you greetings from uh, the executive team at the Atlanta Black Chamber, um, Marky Tate and uh, Mr. Melvin Coleman, um, who could not have been here today, uh, but uh, certainly on behalf of all the leaders in the chamber, um, we're happy to, to be represented here at this uh, table, if you may of wonderful uh, leaders and, um, and business owners and entrepreneurs and individuals. Uh, my name is Ricardo Beris. Um, a funny story, uh, there's an accent I in my name, which sometimes can't be found on the keyboard on the computers. And so it comes off as an I and people will call me Beris. But first time I won't hold it to you, but the second time I probably send you a bill and that might be um, <laughs> what will work me up to being wealthy. Um, but I was born in Jamaica, uh, mom Jamaican, dad was Cuban. Um, and so I'm, I'm a part of the Afro-Hispanic community, if you may. Uh, I've lived in several parts of the world, including South America, um, before I came to, to Miami uh, to reside. And then I moved recently to uh, Atlanta about two years ago. Um, I've known entrepreneurship all my life. I've uh, actually never worked in corporate. so. I started my first company when I when I got out of college, and and this has been my career, if you may. So I'm considered a serial entrepreneur because I've been on several businesses, um, started and ran several businesses, uh, some were successful, and of course I would be kidding if I told you not that some some were uh, all were successful because they weren't all successful, but that there was some great lessons in in those uh, in those experiences. Um, 
my first business was a boutique tutoring company that I started back when I was 20 years old to really help to make a difference in the lives of young people who couldn't make it through to college because they had mathematics and other uh, um, you know, barriers to, to be in place in some of these organizations. And so I wanted to make a difference there. And that's what I did. Uh, grew to three locations and then exited to another company who wanted to really take up from there. Um, one of the things that I noticed uh, after starting several businesses, I'm probably in about my ninth company now, the one thing that's consistent across these businesses for me, uh, it's transformation. And I think we're going to hear a lot more of that today, um, helping other people to become better versions of themselves. And so uh, whether that's uh, business or individually, I think um, that has been uh, my purpose uh, for all of my businesses. Uh, today, I run a technology company. We do develop technology solution and um, we do digital marketing as well. Uh, and we help uh, essentially four different types of people from the startup to the mid-level company who may not necessarily have the internal resources to really um, uh, execute on some of the, 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 the marketing technology or even technology solutions that they need to grow and scale their business. They rely on us as an outsourced partner to really help them. And so it's everything from building custom software to, to helping you to maximize your growth using marketing and uh, work for some of the more popular brands that you might know about, Burger King, for example, um, Courtyard Marriott, um, and some of the other, uh, some of the other quick service restaurants. Uh, but my passion really lies in the transformation that we continue to bring for small businesses who uh, are not uh, tech savvy, uh, I would say, but they're very tech aware. These things are very much known that it's needed in an organization in order for us to grow, uh, but the savviness is not there. And so, so we've got the dirty hands and we'll do the, the work and really help to create those transformation. Um, I've, I've to, I run a few companies and so it's kind of a, it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, we always encourage people not to try it at home. Uh, and, and sometimes just running a full time, uh, just having a full time job might sometimes even be better, depending on who you are. Um, but we have other um, uh, ambitions, including commerce for purpose driven brands that are um, interested in creating an elevation of thriving success for, for themselves, where we highlight only those brands that are impact driven, that are making a difference environmentally, socially. Um, and lastly, I would say uh, as part of our efforts to really uh, help Black-owned, uh, women-owned, and minority-owned businesses. We recently launched uh, our 100, uh, we call it BMW, not to be mistaken by the motor, but a uh, 100 Black, minority, and women-owned uh, technology solution initiative, because we believe that uh, there is too much digital slavery going on, and uh, that's a term, and we can get into that another time. But uh, being a digital slave in this digital plantation doesn't make us digital owner. And so we want to actually change that. So we're granting uh, 100 uh, companies that are owned by uh, um, Black African-American or minority or female owned, a $5,000 um, grant opportunity that we consider as part of a technology solution process to build solution for them, which adds up to about a half a million dollars of grant over the next 12 months that we'd like to give back to our community to help our people build technology solution that they can own and get on the side of ownership as opposed to the side of usership uh, in the digital landscape. And so um, anyone, of course, who's interested in taking advantage of that grant, we encourage you to apply and we can share those links later. But um, I'm excited to be here and I, I thank you so much for the invitation and for having me. And um, Looking forward to add some value during the next uh, couple of, uh, I suppose, the next couple of minutes or hours. All right, thank you very much, Ricardo. And uh, for a man who has traveled extensively as you have, it's only fitting that you have all those clocks behind you with all the different times. You know, so uh, I see Atlanta, I see Morocco, I see Colombia, Miami. You know, so that's great. You know, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our panelists who um, introduced themselves. So now what we're going to do, we're just going to get into um, the Q&A with, you know, I'll, I'll pose some questions to the panelists and they'll, you know, provide answers. And, um, and then afterward, depending upon, we'll try to save some time for general Q&A from the attendees. All right. So this will be like an intimate discussion. 
um, to, you know, just to get us familiarized with some of the things that um, we saw in bullet points, but only more expanded. So what I want to do now is um, I'll start off um, with a question and um, all of our panelists would have an opportunity to, to provide an answer to that question, all right? So we're gonna start off with, um, what is your perspective, right? What is your perspective on the impact African-Americans have made on the US economy and why you think African-Americans continue to be underserved as entrepreneurs? And we'll let Dr. Gray start off with that one. Wow, <laughs> that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe, of course, of course, we have made a continuous uh, and we continue to make a, an improvement in the economy. The reason why I believe that we're underrepresented is that, number one, of course, systemic racism. Mm -hmm. uh, two, we, for some reason, and I can't say all people for some reason, there is uh, this level of not wanting to promote black businesses until February. You know, looking at uh, things, you know, hearing things on television, hearing things on radio, you know, come February, you know, Black History Month, everyone says, let's support black owned businesses, but not hearing it consistently. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, you know, when we don't consistently try to promote black owned businesses when we don't position ourselves we will always get underrepresented because we're all we're so busy trying to please everybody else mm -hmm. rather than being um, proud rather than having a strong sense of um, accomplishment of our own businesses and really, and really uh, in the sense of bragging about our businesses, you know, for those who use social media, and I'm not talking about the LinkedIn, I'm just talking about, you know, the Facebook or the Twitter, we don't brag enough about our own businesses. You know, we brag about the larger black owned businesses, but for, for some of the smaller black owned businesses, they tend to get underrepresented because we're quick to um, point out something that they've done wrong but when something is done right, we don't want to go ahead and say, hey, look, let's go ahead and support them. So I think that, you know, we have conti we continuously make improvements, but until we get over this systemic racism and this and this psychological, um, the this psychological warfare that we have in our spirit and within our gut to always want to promote black owned businesses, then I think we will always continue to be underserved and underrepresented. All right, thank you, Dr. Gray. And same question to Jose Papi Villa. What, do you, what, are your, what is your perspective on that? Well, you know, I, I, I think uh, part of the problem uh, in my, my black community and my Latino community uh, is that many, many times, well, number one, we, we don't have the same access to capital, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, we may have a great idea, you know, and, and a, a, a great plan, but, uh, you know, as we know, uh, I think venture capitalists, something like 90% uh, of, of venture capital goes to, to, to white owned firms, you know? Uh, black firms get very little of the, of the venture capital that, that's out there. And I, I was glad to see that there are a couple of, of, of black companies now that are actually creating a venture capital network mm -hmm. for black entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I think that that's number one. I, I think an, another problem that we've had is uh, having been a president of an of a African-American chamber and also president of, of, a, of a Hispanic chamber, uh, many times our folks are so busy working at the business, whatever that business is, that they don't have that opportunity to network with some of the really positive role models that we have, certainly like Sister Ronique here, who, who runs an amazing organization, uh, and yourself, uh, Austin, who, who you know you're 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 going out and teaching in 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 these communities and and in these businesses. You know we haven't had that. Um, I, I know I, we, I was talking to the the SBA, and we were in Rochester, New York, and also in Buffalo, and I was telling the folks that. You guys need to have people that look like us and talk like us teaching these SBA classes and the certification classes and the SBA, you know, because the, the, the problem is that we have these great corporate 
or government uh, programs that are designed for our community. But we don't have someone that connects the dots, mm -hmm. you know, someone that, that, that is a true advocate for, for our businesses on the street. So that I'm, let's say when I'm sitting in an in a, in a 8A class with the SBA and they're talking about all the wonderful things that the 8A does, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, the brother on the street saying, but how does that, what does that do for my business? Mm -hmm. How are you helping my business? You know, we, we, we don't have that, that connecting mechanism, you know, and to me, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm an advocate for the chambers because uh, they're this, they're this nucleus of, of, of black professionals that can help us. I think something that's happened, uh, it's been a, going back to brothers uh, transformation uh, thing. In the last two years with COVID-19, you know, with I think last year, 400,000 people quit their jobs in April, mm -hmm. another 400,000 quit their jobs in September. You know, many of those people said, you know what, I'm just going to start my own business. And many of those people were in our small ethnic communities, you know, and now, uh, we have the tools, we have the internet, you know, we, we have the software tools that, that can enable us. So I see that this whole, this new generation of entrepreneurs that's, that's, that's building because they have the, the tools that, that, you know, like my generation didn't have, you know? So I see certainly my, my role is, is, is helping the, the, the brothers and the sisters that, that are coming behind me and, and then kind of passing it on, you know, te teaching, you know, making that part of the legacy. What, what have we learned? How do we pass it on? Just like brother uh, uh, Lyndon is doing with, with, with his Operation Hope. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very I'll much, Papa. Thank you. Thank you. Some really, really great, um, you know, food for thought there. Um, let's, go, let's go with brother Lyndon. You know, um, what is your perspective and, and what can you contribute? Your mic, your mic is off. <laughs> I tell you, I'm so used to just having it on where I could just talk whenever I'm ready. And now I'm uh, having to control it a little bit more. But uh, what I was saying was that, um, you know, the impact that African-Americans made on the U.S. economy has been quite significant. Uh, the problem, I think, is that especially in the early stages, the you know, 1900s and stuff like that. Uh, the other man knew about you know, patents and was able to easily steal many inventions from us. And uh, I remember going to a, a high school during Black History Month many years ago and seeing all the inventions that were uh, invented by Black folks. And certainly if those patents had been retained there would have been a huge amount of wealth that would have developed out of that. A lot of long-term companies with, you know, families behind them that could have been rich for decades, you know, just like Budweiser, hundreds of years of uh, cash flow. A lot of these businesses, uh, the guy that invented the, um, the uh, fireman's hood, breathing apparatus, the elevator, the uh, straightening comb, there's so many things that the you know patent got lifted and that's interrupted a lot of wealth from flowing from a hundred years ago. Uh, you know, there could have been a lot of wealth generation for our culture, culture to build off of for all of these decades. And I think that that's one big issue that we're, we're faced with is that lost income, um, you know, cause the hundreds of thousands of dollars back then are obviously worth millions of dollars right now. So I think that we lost a lot back in that period. And, uh, you know, even though we're making significant uh, strides right now in other areas, you know, we still have that against us and we're still at a deficit. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, that was um, is, is entrepreneurship, is entrepreneurship the pathway for, uh, to, to generating wealth? It's definitely program. one of them. Okay. Okay, it's great. It's definitely one of them. I still think that there needs to be more than just entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. uh, that we, we would need to, you know, have the gap being closed in other areas as well, including the corporate area, the medical and technology areas certainly need 
to have a lot of black uh, contributions made, but certainly entrepreneurship is, is definitely a, a great start. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Sister Ronique, what is your perspective on, on the subject? Well, I want to say congrats. I apologize. I didn't congratulate you oh. on your speech <laughs> earlier. So I do apologize for that. But uh, one thing I'm not hearing that we're not discussing is consumerism. Uh -huh. um, Black people are the like the number one consumers almost everywhere. We really control the market. Um, we control a lot of the trends. We are high consumers when it comes to watching TV, when it comes to buying, whatever it may be. So I, that consumerism has to begin to change into ownership. And I, a lot of people said take pride into buying from black businesses. We got We Buy Black, which is like our black Amazon. It's a lot of places where you can find how to support black businesses, whether it be the black chambers, our directories um, and so forth. So we have to really consciously make an effort um, to even take one of our normal products that we use monthly in our household ourselves, even hold ourselves accountable, then we can hold others accountable to do the same thing. For example, I push, I change my vitamins. Everybody takes vitamins daily to pro, pro black health vitamins. You can order them online. So we all have to begin to look at how do we become consumers, constant consumers with own, our own black businesses so they can grow and continue to uh, gain attrition. But then going to access the capital, even working capital, it is still a major problem for our black owned businesses. Um, we have to address that. The PPP lending, I see so many comments about it. I see so much stuff on social media um, and, and us, our black businesses being, you know, charged or whatever it may be, but we only got 1% of the PPP lending. That was reported by the Federal Reserve Bank. You know, even after all these, all the grants that are flowing through the economy with the COVID-19 money, the ARP dollars, that's something as a, a chamber organization that we have been definitely heavily advocating to make sure we can run a programming for our community. What Jose said earlier um, is really important um, regarding us building the capacity during the training for our community. We just closed out a grant program where we gave $75,000 in grants, 25 businesses. Uh, we have a 500K program we're running now in the city of, uh, city of Aiken, South Carolina. Um, that's something that I'm very passionate about to make sure that we not only are in interjecting capital into our businesses, but providing that working capital. And then we have about 300,000 new business owners in the state of Georgia, black owned businesses um, since the pandemic. So um, that training, that capacity, that means we have an influx of entrepreneurs, new business owners that are in the um, in this arena now. And they're learning as they go because they were forced through the pandemic because maybe loss of jobs, automation, whatever that may be, which was going to continue. Um, automation is going to impact our community about 51% uh, of our workforce. So that's something that, you know, is definitely a pathway to wealth. Equal pay has to be addressed. I know he, uh, I know the uh, other gentleman just talked about jobs and so forth. Well, you can work a job, but if you're not getting paid equally, <laughs> um, you, you can't really build wealth as someone else. But that ownership, even that investment has to come up and we have to begin to take pride in ourselves and invest in ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, but we definitely support the economy. I always say we took a, a, a month off and decided to only support our black owned businesses. Mm -hmm. The American economy will fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thank, thank you, um, Sister Ronique. And, you know, automation, productivity, you know, that's killing jobs. It's, it's taking salaries and discretionary income out of the hands of those who can spend it in their own communities. And, you know, lack of access to capital and um, all of the things you mentioned, um, those, those are serious things to really consider. You know, and um, Brother Ricardo, um, what, do you, what, are your, what is your perspective and thoughts on that? Well, I mean, and I and I, I don't want to repeat what was already said because the, I think I think those were really valid points. Um, okay. One of the things that I'm thinking about is education for our people uh, from as early as possible can be, whether it's early childhood or uh, pre-K. I, I think going as far back and and really transforming the education system for our people. Uh, will make a, a, a huge impact 100 years from now. Um, and, and, I, and I think that when you think about where things are going from a technological standpoint um, and where we are as a people in terms of the gap as it relates to our education and the adaptation of technology, 
it, it's going to stronghold us um, um, even 20 years from now. And w- the jobs that we're talking about, the access to the capital that we're talking about, I think, I think it, it all comes from a derivative of just the lack of the the right education. Um, you know, when I my father was a math professor, and and perhaps that came down through me. I used to be called a math god when I was in school, and people used to pay me to do math homework for them. I think that was kind of a blessing. Uh, but the the very mere fact that uh, almost 20 years ago I started a boutique tutoring company to help kids with math, uh, and today we still have a problem with how even math as a as a subject in the STEM space, if you may. Uh, whether even science, any of these uh, technical um, um, analytical uh, skills uh, or people lack a lot of those. Um, As we go through business, uh, one of the things that we do in our company is data analytics. And a lot of the businesses that we serve, uh, they don't have that as part of their business. They don't understand how to analyze data, how to interpret it and how to make decisions based on data. And you ask, where is that coming from? And that has to come from a place of the lack of uh, education where that's concerned. And the gentleman, I think, uh, uh, Poppy talks about uh, the fact that, again, you work on your business so much, I mean, in your business so much that you don't get a chance to work on it. And I think uh, the education that we can deliver for entrepreneurship uh, has to be radically different to help us understand how do we work on the business and not in it because the the statistics will tell you there's so many businesses in the country but over what 90 plus percent if I'm not mistaken are owned by just 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 one employee one one individual who runs that business and how do you achieve any semblance of scale how do you achieve any semblance of growth uh, how do you leave a legacy uh, if you are the uh, if you are the only owner, the only employee, the only one, and so there's really nothing to really help uh, those folks. Um, I think it's it, even if there is help, there's not enough of it. So I think I think those things are crucial, and 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 their impediment to uh, to the community that we are in, uh, because it, it just doesn't help us to uh, to grow. Right, and that's important. Educational education, excuse me, skills adoption. Uh, learning new skills, expanding the breadth of, of um, skills and knowledge in, in your respective areas and, um, you know, working on your business, not working in it and helping it to grow. And, and those are all key, key points um, for us to take note. Um, this, this next question will really, um, I know a lot of, uh, of us who are small business owners, we always want to know why is it more of the black dollars? Why is it more of the disposable income from African Americans don't flow our way, don't 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 come to us, you know. Um, the black purchasing power is at 1.4 trillion dollars now. Um, according to NAACP studies, it takes the black dollar six hours to circulate in the black community versus 28 days in the Asian community, 19 days in the Jewish community, and 17 days in white communities in comparison to the six hours in the black community, right before it, before it leaves. How can we encourage African-Americans to spend more of their disposable income with black owned businesses? What do we need to do to encourage them to do that? Uh, Brother Linden. I caught it that time. Yeah, I saw you looking, I saw you looking the mic. <laughs> well, um... Not to beat a dead horse, but I want to reiterate what Brother Ricardo said, and that's that we need to educate and promote consistently. Uh, This is the only way more people can be aware. And look at the example set by commercials. They'll run the same commercials for Coca-Cola over and over through a a movie. And next thing you know, they're selling Coca-Cola over at the, uh, you know, refreshment stand. So, we, we need to consistently, uh, you know, just keep on educating and putting it out there. Uh, we need to let people know how serious it is to help our community grow. Uh, right now, we are the number three economy. Uh, during the 70s, we were the number two economy. Uh, if we're not careful, you know, and I'm not racist in any way, but, 
you know, the Asians, Indians, uh, Arabs, they're going to come in, get business loans, uh, grow their community. And if we're not careful, we can drop down to number four or number five. So I really stress and urge us all to take this very seriously and to come up with a plan that we can keep uh, pushing the fact that our money staying in the community just six hours versus days and weeks in other communities. And another thing is that if you look at their model, their business model, they start a business, then they bring in someone else from their country uh, or from their community to run it while someone starts a new one. And they're constantly working together uh, to build their businesses. You know, if 15 of them have to live into a house for a short period of time, that's just what they do. And they, they help each other with business. And, you know, we're the only race that, that will not go back and help each other in this way. And if you look, some, some other races can actually not get along with each other, but they still have their eye on the prize and they will still work together for the greater good, whether they like each other or not. So I think we need to overcome that. You know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, crab mentality in the black community. We need to get rid of that. We need to be pushing each other up instead of pulling each other down. And um, that's just one of the ways I see that, you know, we can get that dollar to circulate a little bit longer in the community. Hmm. Sister Ronique, do you think um, the, the fear of taking a risk, right? Um, do you think that plays into it just as much as the, the lack of access to capital? Um, you know, the fear of taking a risk or, and not working toward um, options to uh, uh, capital from banks and so on and so forth. Do you think the fear itself take a, uh, plays into it? I think so. Um, I, I'm thinking back before integration, we had black businesses, strong black businesses. We had Black Wall Street. We had um, everything that we're talking about. So it's not something that we can't do. It's not so far fetched that it's something that is so far removed. I just think we don't see it today as much. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think one is we have to begin to understand our own history. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything we've ever done, we can do again. Right. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I, I know we have a lot of things that seems like it's mounting against us, but just know that we've had our own economy. We had our own neighborhoods. We had our ecosystems. Doesn't mean that we didn't interact with uh, other folks because we couldn't, but then we fought to get integration, but we should have really fought to make sure our economics was stable before we got integrated. You know, one thing that I'm going to kind of bring into the conversation is we've been taught <laughs> to spend our money elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's kind of by design. You can call it systematic and so forth, especially when you start looking at data and you start pulling numbers and so forth. We also have some trust issues amongst our community, right? Mm -hmm. Not being able to trust each other, not understanding that um, it takes us to come together. I like what the gentleman just said but that was talking before me about other communities don't have to necessarily like each other, but they will still go to that common purpose or get that common goal or get that business up and so forth. So we have to begin to get back to that. And I think about the paradigmic principles that are in the book that Dr. Claude Anderson wrote uh, for our community. As he talks about us, we will become a permanent underclass if we don't start to change our trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to understand these are real things. And I think Killer Mike did a documentary on where he actually uh, worked to, I think it was like a week or maybe three days where all he had to do, he had to shop at only black owned businesses. He could, mm -hmm. I mean, for everything. So one night he ended up having to sleep on a park bench actually, because he couldn't find a hotel or somewhere to stay that night. So it's, you know, it's, it's something that one, I believe our community can definitely get back to. It's going to take some personal changes, some intentional changes, though, and some consistency amongst all of us and holding ourselves accountable. And then each one reaches one has to be that part. And then us creating ecosystems and safe spaces for our black owned businesses is critical. That's why I'm so passionate about helping the black chamber stand up across the South um, and, 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 and providing where I can, because that safe space for our businesses to grow, to get away, you know, if they want to grow besides solopreneur and begin to hire employees to scale, we have to be the ones to provide those spaces for ourselves 
um, again. I'm very passionate about that. And then because then we can begin to address some of those internal issues. Um, right. And then you see things change really quickly. Right. And um, uh, Brother Poppy, um, same thing, your perspective on that, uh, but in respect to the Afro-Latino community and um, uh, keeping more of the, those dollars, those discretionary income within the La Afro-Latino communities, Afro-Latinos supporting and patronizing businesses. What is your perspective on that? Well, you know, uh, I, I grew up with the duality. You know, my, 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 my parents are Puerto Rican. Uh, mm. The descendants of the African slaves that that, that, that the Spaniards brought to, uh, to to Puerto Rico, so I grew up in a Puerto Rican community, Spanish Harlem, you know, uh, and and yet I'm a I'm a, I'm a black man, so I was also part of the of the African American experience. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I I grew up kind of you know kind of straddling the fence, having a foot on on either side of the fence, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, that that experience, it, <clears throat> excuse me, has has given me a kind of an opportunity to to appreciate both sides, you know, my my my, my black community, my my Hispanic community, but the reality is, as 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 a black Latino, as an Afro Latino, which is a you know, which is a fairly new term, by the way, it's only been out, you know, you know, s several years. Mm -hmm. um, I've never really been accepted in 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 many cases in the in the Hispanic community, mm -hmm. in the Hispanic arena. You know, uh, I've been president of our Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And, and in that context, we used to go to the annual Hispanic conferences every year uh, throughout the nation. And and I know like my my wife is Mexican. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, what I noticed is a lot of times when when, uh, you know, we, we went up to Hispanic group, she would, you know, she'd introduce me and then she'd have to explain the fact that, oh, you know, he's a Hispanic of African descent. It's like. Why do I have to be explained? You know, nobody else has to be explained here, but because I'm a black Latino, I had to be explained. You know, mm -hmm. and and so uh, so in, within the Hispanic community, you know, there, there's always been that issue. Now we, we hear a lot about uh, you know the, these Afro Colombians or the of course the, the Dominicans, which are huge the Afro Afro Cubans. Uh, about 15 years ago, my wife and I went to Veracruz, Mexico, and I was surprised to see. All these black Mexicans, mm -hmm. Afro Mexicans. I, you know, I, I'd never, I just never even heard of that. But so, the Afro Latino community has always been a part of of the black community. I'd mm -hmm. say it's, it's it's only very recently, maybe in the last five or, or ten years, where I've started noticing kind of, uh, kind of a, a, a segmenting of that market and saying, mm -hmm. oh, well, I'm I'm Afro Latino, you know, mm -hmm. but. But we we've always been a part of just the African or the African American community here and and and, and that experience. Right, know. right. Yeah, because the um when we look at the the Hispanic purchasing power, it's about 1.6 trillion. And just behind that, the purchasing power of African Americans is 1.4. But so that's that's a lot of discretionary disposable income potentially out in the market. Um that could be out in the market, right? And you know, if, if we can, you know, devise ways in which through education, right, has been mentioned um, to work and, and getting more of those dollars directed towards our black owned businesses, not only will they, uh, you know, increase in revenue and be able to, you know, expand their businesses, but also hire and provide jobs, right, the, the, uh, hiring additional employees. So that's, you know, that's something that we definitely uh, can focus on. You know, and if, if I if I may, I I I don't I don't want to dance around this subject, but yeah, the the reality is, our black community was essentially taught to hate itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, you know mm -hmm. that was even even on the back in the plantation days when when we had the you know the <laughs> the house folks that that worked in the house, and then you had the the rest of us that were working in the field. You know, right, right. Even within the black community, we we were we started discriminating against each other. And right. That was that was systemic. You know mm -hmm. that that goes back to those four hundred years. Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, that's that's an issue that we've never really gotten over or been able to circumvent. Mm -hmm. And now we're dealing with it in in today's marketplace. Mm -hmm. you know? Why mm -hmm. aren't we spending our dollars in the black community? Because a lot of times, you know. We we don't trust our own community, right? You know? Right. 
uh, many times when, when we, you know, I have someone that an African-American and we're, we're going to do business. And one of the first thing that they say is, so what you're going to do for me? <laughs> right? What yeah. kind of discount you're going to give me? Yes. You know? Why yeah. is that? You don't ask for a discount when you go to Sears. Yes. You know, you don't ask for a discount when you go to Safeway. Mm -hmm. But why is it that you're going to ask me for a discount? Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's that it's that that kind of mindset that that's within our, our society that has mm -hmm. to be overcome. Yes. That mindset yeah. shift, mindset change. Yes. And it's OK to to pay the price points that's presented to you for that product or service, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Right, right. and Dr. Gray, uh, speak to spirituality, the role that spirituality plays in um, entrepreneurship. We know there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who are starting businesses or those who have existing businesses, they tend to pray and they tend to, you know, um, evoke, scriptures into growing a business and developing a business. Spirituality seems to be a big part for a lot of folks, right? Driving their business forward. Can you speak to that? Well, um, in, in coming with that, I don't, I don't want to just deal with one particular faith. You know, yeah. everyone has their own faith, so I don't want anyone right, right. to think that, I, that I'm promoting. Um, when, when it comes to faith, you'll hear many people, many people say that there was a, there was a calling on their life, that calling can be equated to faith. Because when you look at faith, um, I taught a class called Faith in Human Experience, that your experience can be directly linked to your faith. So in, in this particular case, many people have, have this calling that they will say, you know, I, I, I'm not meant to do this for this particular company, but I have a calling to do this particular job. So, so they'll have a particular scripture, they'll have, you know, whether it's meditation, or whether they're invoking a higher power. And what they have done, they continuously use that higher power to guide them to to keep them focused. Because in the real sense, no matter if you're starting by yourself or if you're starting with a team, you're going to face some ups and downs. You're, you're, you're going to face some high roads. You're going to face some low roads. And no matter what somebody may tell you, you're going to have to invoke spirituality to get you through when you're not getting the contract, when, when your money is funny, when, when things aren't going your way. That's when you kind of just draw on faith to ask yourself the question, why am I doing what I'm doing. And then, you know, people, you know, we go back to that scripture, write the vision, make it plain. And I think that all of us, when we have started our own businesses, started our own quest, we've all written the vision, whether it was a vision, a business plan, um, a marketing plan, we wrote something down that guides us, that continuously fuels us. So whatever someone's faith is, that is their that's that that's that's their fuel to have them wake up in the morning and keep doing what they're doing. Why are you doing this? Why have, why are you called? It's not just I need to make money or I need to have my independence, but it's something that can either be explained or maybe sometimes that even that can be indescribable in many cases of why you're doing what you're doing. So I would definitely say faith, especially within the African-American community um, is essential for our businesses. I think a lot of times when people try to bombard you with their faith, you know, I, I tell you, I'm a pastor, when they bombard you with their faith, you know, going to businesses, you know, you see in scriptures here and there, and it can become quite um, intimidating. Mm -hmm. Especially if you don't subscribe to that faith practice, right? So, right. so I, th I think I think it's important that we know our limits, but we also know what fuels us, and be able to communicate that, not just to other people, but to commun communicate that within our own being. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, sir. And brother Barris, you have the distinction of being um, uh, you have a dual ethnicity. You have Cuban, Jamaican heritage, right? Dual heritage, excuse me. 
And um, is there anything in your upbringing, right, coming from a Jamaican and Cuban background, right, that, that um, contributed to uh, using spirituality to grow you successfully? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think uh, I think there's definitely that. I mean, you know, it was a rule to go to church when when we were kids. Um, it was not an option, um, and we learned principles and morals and values were instilled in us because uh, we had to report to church every weekend uh, mm -hmm. by by the command of our parents. And um, and and we're talking about church. It's not a one hour conversation, um, and then you head back home. We're literally talking about waking up from seven and leaving and going home at five or six. So you had an entire day almost um, of just just pouring into you on different different matters. I think it helped to groom um, who we ultimately become. And obviously, uh, it invokes that, again, that spiritualness into what we do, uh, our business and, and, and our communities. And, and we want that to continue. Sometimes there is uh, fear, as the doctor says, around uh, people who may not necessarily uh, subscribe to that. Um, they they respond to it very differently, and your response to that response is maybe you have to tone things down, um, and and that changes things for whether it's your kids or for your family, just because you you also wonder what would people think about. Um, your display of, uh, of faith because they may not want to spend with you because they may have a very different ideology of what that is. So I think that I think that plays a, a, a huge role in what we end up doing today. Um, it's, it's really what I've learned growing up that has kept me in those communities. And so being, being in, in, in Jamaica, of course, of course uh, spirituality is, uh, is, is, is very heavy. And it's, it's, it's one of the things that I also subscribe to the theory and I, I don't have empirical uh, data to speak to tonight, mm -hmm. but I do, I do believe that, uh, or people because of, or, or the, the challenges and the struggles that we've been through the suffering, it, it really had led us down a path to be a lot more stronger in our faith and, uh, to hold on to uh, something greater, than what was around us because there was nothing around us except for ourselves and um and we really had to find something that was a lot more uh higher a, a supreme sort of being to hold on to and i think that historically has led us to be perhaps one of the most resilient set of people when it comes to faith um in in the african-american and the afro-hispanic community yeah because faith and, and and faith and a connection to spirituality got us through slavery Faith exactly. and connection to spirituality got us through Jim Crow, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, faith and spirituality gets many through education, through starting a business, surviving in corporate, you know. So it's so it's it's an important component in in in, in people's lives, regardless of to whom you pray, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's an it's an important part of our lives, right? And I wanna I wanna actually touch on. Uh, the, the the historical accounts of, of Black Wall Street because that's also a <laughs> uh, significant um, um, occurrence in our history as African Americans in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Sister Ronique mentioned that uh, African Americans were successful, you know, many years ago in growing businesses and mm -hmm. growing strong economies in their communities. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no reason why we can't, you know, see that. In this in this present time, mm -hmm. so um, I just want to I just want to um, read off some statistics, and then we can get into a discussion on Black Wall Street, and each of you can give your perspective. Right. So we know we know basically last year last year um, it was the 100th anniversary, mm -hmm. right, of the remembrance of the massacre, not the riot, but the massacre, right, of over 300 people in Black Wall on in Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, right. Uh, occurred over the period of May 31st to June 1st. So it was just two days, right? So um, it, it consisted of um, residents, Black residents in that community uh, being attacked and massacred by white racist men with guns and, of course, with airplanes that dropped bombs um, on the various community members, destroying a tremendous amount of property, right? Um, again, th over 300 Black residents killed 
Um, Greenwood had 200 businesses until the 1921 massacre. Uh, the community consisted of 10,000 residents. Uh, the Dreamland Theater, they had a very um, a successful theater with uh, 750 seats in that theater. Uh, the J.B. Stratford Hotel was the largest African-American hotel in the U.S. at that time. They had about 15 doctor's offices, two schools, grocery stores, cleaning businesses, drug stores, um, over 1,250 houses, uh, homes destroyed. And, and, I, and, and, you know, I was looking at the videos that I sent out to you all, and there was a sister that mentioned um, and I hope they, uh, uh, Poppy, you mentioned um, the, the generational wealth and us total 2 million at that time with the future value to this present day of, that would have been 28 million, right? 28 million. And the video said that a tremendous amount of generational wealth was lost because of, of, of the millions of dollars that um, due to the, the, the massacre and the attacks and the, the total destruction and demolishing of Black Wall Street, right? Um, uh, the, 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 grand, the grandchildren of those uh, who resided in that community weren't able to you know, benefit from that wealth, right? So what I wanna ask each of you, and I wanna, I wanna go around and start with um, Lyndon, um, just to give me your your overall thoughts on what what occurred um, over those two day period, and do you think that it's something that we can replicate, you know, in this present time? Because it was a, a large amalgamation of businesses and families who were successful, who were affluent, who were financially set, you know, and they lived in the community. Only reason why they concentrated in that community is because in North Tulsa, they didn't want to do it. They didn't want any blacks in that area. They didn't want to serve any blacks. They didn't want to employ any blacks. So the, the, the residents in that area decided to create their own community, mm -hmm. right? So that they can flourish and, and, and support one another. So what are your overall thoughts? And do you think it's something that we can replicate to this day? I think that we can, and the sister said it earlier, if we did it before, we can do it again, mm -hmm. except better because we've got technology in the picture now so we can actually have everything network control, so to speak, but uh, definitely involving uh, electronic and uh, IT technology into whatever we do now. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say and get off of my head because <clears throat> ever since I saw that video you sent me, it's mm -hmm. been stuck and locked in my mind mm -hmm. that those very visual pictures of the aftermath of Black Wall Street getting bombed reminded me exactly of Hiroshima and mm -hmm. people charred, uh, trees burnt down with no leaves. I mean, it, it looked like the same exact thing to me. And the U.S. government went in and rebuilt Japan, mm -hmm. gave them reparations and hooked them up. And now look at that. They, 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 it looks like a, a neon capital of the world, but they didn't go back to Black Tulsa and do mm -hmm. that and turn it into what could be a modern day Las Vegas type of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that has stuck in my mind, my mind that I vowed that I would speak on tonight. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, what happened to the reparations? What happened to the rebuilding after they bombed everything down to the ground? You know, mm -hmm. so uh, that's one thing I would love to find out more about and, mm -hmm. and advocate for those funds to be restored to the people most tragically affected by it. But mm -hmm. it's my opinion, but I think that it had to be a multi-tiered conspiracy because mm -hmm. airplanes were involved. Airplanes means, you know, some form of high level government cooperation that took place because airplanes just don't go up in the air without being monitored. So right. it all had to be approved by somebody or somebody's. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of stuff that's not being spoken about or addressed. 
-hmm. And, you know, the white folks, just like you said, they all agreed that they would not let the black businesses flourish up where they were. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they flourished where they lived on the black side of town. But the white folks just couldn't stand seeing black folks flourish. So, you know, right now I can see not only a black Wall Street on the east side of town, like in uh, Stonecrest, what we have, but I can also see a black Wall Street south on the Mm -hmm. south side of Atlanta, black Wall Street north, black Mm -hmm. North Street west, and Mm -hmm. many other cities need to demand to create a black wall street somewhere i remember growing up in brooklyn we had delancey street and we had to go up to uh manhattan downtown manhattan to you know that wasn't the only place to shop but that was the place we chose to shop and we we spent our money on delancey street getting leather jackets and quarter fields and you know the sheepskins and all that stuff but um again i think it should be a mission of every yes black community across every state of this country mm-hmm. just to shove it in their face to go on and let's remake black wall streets all mm-hmm. over america mm-hmm. and i like the intentional construction of what's happening in stonecrest you know and i'd like to see you said the south side the north i'd like to see that replicated where the west end mall used to be in yes sir area. love to see it over there especially around the au center yep. you know that would be another prime Education, area. Yeah. Exactly. Brother Via, what do you think? What is, what is your perspective? Well, it's to me, uh, the man has always used that same business model. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he did it with the Native Americans. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a, there's a song, and I, I forget who the, who the group was, but it says, the song says, they took the whole Cherokee nation mm-hmm. and put them on a reservation. Mm-hmm. You know, he did the same thing with the with the native Hawaiians. Mm-hmm. The missionaries came here and took the land that belonged to the to the Hawaiians. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, during World War II, the government did it again. Took all those Japanese Americans, put them in Mansonar and all those mm-hmm. internment camps, mm-hmm. and took over their farms, their properties, everything that they had. You know, mm-hmm. and you, I mean, you, you, you may have read recently about the Bruce family mm-hmm. in uh, Manhattan Beach, Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. You know, in 1912, their family bought the land there in Manhattan Beach. Mm-hmm. And later, the, 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 uh, the state declared eminent domain. Mm-hmm. They took over the property. They let the city of Los Angeles buy the property. Mm-hmm. And the Bruce family has been fighting that until I think about two weeks ago, Governor Newsom said that they were going to return that land to the family, Mm -hmm. which has been fighting for reparations. Mm -hmm. It's three acres of land in Manhattan Beach, which is now worth $75 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as the comment that was made before, there have been about four generations of Black families in that Bruce family that having, having benefited, haven't benefited from what their ancestors did, you know. They've struggled, you know, and now it's the, they believe it's the great, great grandson mm-hmm. who has kept fighting for the reparations. Mm-hmm. And now that's finally paid off and they're, they're gonna get those three acres of land back. And like mm-hmm. they say, the property around those three acres, the homes are selling for $7 million average. Right. So th- these folks are, you know, so, so it's all, the struggle, what, what they didn't have, the uh, deprivation, mm-hmm. you know, which essentially the same thing. And, and I was, as Lyndon is saying, what about the reparations for uh, Greenwood? Right. You know, those businesses were, 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 were taken over. Uh, last year, we celebrated the 100th uh, commemoration. Mm-hmm. But what about those, the, the 100 years of those families, those five generations mm-hmm. of Black families? that didn't receive any of the benefits from what their ancestors created. Right, right. You know, uh, can, it be, can it be done again? Uh, I mean, absolutely. A, you know, the, the Black Wall Street can be replicated, but I think back to, I think it was Ronique that mentioned the, the, the comment about being intentional. 
mm-hmm. about want, about wanting to do that. Lyndon was saying about you know working together and 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 making that happen. And and also Brother uh, Ricardo was talking about uh, transformation. You know, right. we as a black business community need to build these types of of uh, of you know localized models intentionally and to create that 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 transformative uh, marketplace that Ricardo was talking about earlier. Exactly, exactly. And Dr. Gray, your, your perspective and your words. Well, I pretty much agree with what everyone has said, but well, I'm just going to add my two cents. I think while we do it intentionally, mm-hmm. one of the things that we have to do, we have to change our mindset. And the reason why I say we change our mindset, and I'm going to get a little spiritual. Whenever you mention Israel to our white conservative uh, right wingers, they always tell they will always tell Israel, Israel, to protect yourself at all costs. Mm-hmm. The United States will send money. The United States will defend Israel. Mm-hmm. What we need to do when we create our own Black Wall Street, mm-hmm. we need to let the government and let everybody know we will defend our own businesses. We're not turning the cheek. We're not running scared. We will do whatever we can to protect this community, to protect our businesses. And what happens, and I'm not trying to promote violence, but what happens is that you have to meet the adversary with their own language. If the adversary is talking violence, as Malcolm X said, and you're speaking peace and love, they're going to look at you funny. But if you let them know this is our community, we have built this, and we're willing to fight and to die for this. Mm -hmm. And in the process, we will do whatever. You will pay a price. Then guess what? They would then take you serious, take people seriously. I think what we need to do is just change the mindset. It can be done, but you know, in the process, we must continuously to support. And I think what happens is that when we build the Wall Street, we can't always keep trying to fit, trying to depend on other people from outside the culture to right. come in into our community. Exactly. You know, if we want to build Black Wall Street, make it Black owned. Mm-hmm. If, if it's not benefiting the community, if it's not benefiting us, you can't be a part of it. Put stipulations in, and you know, I don't want to sound crazy, but put stipulations mm-hmm. and let people know once it's established, we're going to protect it by any means yeah. necessary. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and what you're saying is truthful, you know. Um, the board of directors, you know, the leadership, you know, should be black entrepreneurs who understand the seriousness of growing um a, a black Wall Street and with the with the with the potential of replicating what we had prior to 1921, because it wasn't just Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, it was Wilmington, North Carolina, it was Rosewood, Florida, you know, you had communities in Tennessee, in, in Tennessee, you know, there were hundreds of communities that were prospering and, and affluent that were burned down, destroyed, you know, in, in order to, to suppress the rise of affluent black communities, and these were deliberate, right? So I, I, I understand. Mm-hmm. And if anyone has ever grown up in the D.C., I'm, I'm from the Washington, D.C. area, back oh. in the 30s and 40s, you had prosperous Black communities. Yes. Even though it wasn't considered Black Wall Street, you saw, you know, rather than burning it down, you saw gentrification come in. Mm-hmm. And when gentrification came in, that's when Black businesses decided to move out. You know, we were so busy trying to integrate that we that we decided not to desegregate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, you know, we look at, you know, I was listening to a lot of tapes by, um, you know, my, my tra- you know, growing up by um, Honorable Elijah Muhammad and doing his whole thing. He was always teaching, start your own school, start mm-hmm. your own business. You know, you have to, you know, he wasn't preaching segregation. He was preaching separation. You know, segregation was a legal term. Separation is a voluntary, it's something you do voluntarily. So while they were preaching um having your own we were trying so much to say okay let's all can we just all get along nothing wrong with getting along but what happens when you get along you forget your own and when you forget your own then you start suffering you start putting your hand out and say what about me could you please support me and that's why when we come together 
you know, for a forum like this, when we start saying it's important to have our own businesses, then we need to create our own schools. Going back to what, you know, uh, you know, or everyone said, educate, educate, and educate. You know, create your own, call your own shots. Because mm -hmm. when you call your own shots, then you choose who you're voting for. You know, right. you know, Austin, you know, I've already, I've already congratulated you, Austin. So yeah. I don't have to congratulate you again. But, but you know, um, you can have people that look like you on the same agenda that's on the city council. Mm -hmm. You say, you know, when you come to our neighborhood now, we have power. If there's no, if there, you know, if we, if we as a communal have any economic power, any power, then we can't control anything. Right. But, you know, but once we control and we own, then in a sense, you come to us and then we come to you with our demands. Right. So that, that, that's, that's my two cents. So exactly. And before I get to Ricardo and, and Ronique, I just want to say, so for all the for all the entrepreneurs, the small business owners on this um, uh, discussion tonight, um, I, I know no one has the perfect system of growing their business, but you know we have you know five consultants. We have two chamber representatives on this call. Uh, we have Lyndon Jackson, Dr. Saint Clair Gray, uh, Jose Papi Villa, extensive knowledge and expertise. And when we talk about growing the black dollar, growing uh, black businesses successfully, reach out, connect, um, and 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 cry for assistance. You know, cry for assistance, call out for assistance, seek assistance, because the only way that we're going to grow successfully, as Brother Barrett said earlier, education and and growing that knowledge base. Right. So, um, Brother Ricardo, real quick, uh, um, and then I get to Sister Ronique. Uh, how can how how what role um, could the, the the Atlanta Black Chambers or a Black Chamber play in in getting us back to what we had before 1921? Well, you know, and that's a great question. I think um, Black Chambers in general, it's really a, a vital role in the Black entrepreneur community. It's that ecosystem that's needed. Um, um, I heard uh, this morning uh, a chiropractor refers to if you want to be fine, you got to take care of your spine, right? And it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a very interesting um, uh, phrase that he used. Mm -hmm. And I think for us uh, as a uh, black community, as black entrepreneurs, if we want to be fine, we've got to lean into the black chambers. We've got to lean into that ecosystem mm -hmm. because because we need that central space to connect. We need that central space we can collaborate and create new opportunities, right? And that's yeah. what the black chambers represent. And so so the, the the and the black chambers are it's a conglomerate of black businesses from from business communities, from black communities. Which, which represents a source for, for timely and curated information. I think when you talk about access to critical resources, the people, the place itself, the places that we do business, and all of these things that are required to take our businesses to the next level, I think the chamber's role really provides that access and that exposure for Black entrepreneurship. I mean, we never met um, uh, unless it was the chamber. I, I don't think we would have met um, anytime soon, if it was not for an introduction to the chamber. So I think, I think those little things and they add up, right? Where where we can really lean into the, the chamber as an organization. Now, you know, and on another thought too, just I'm a part of all the chambers, and one of the things that I realized that historically the chamber is almost like an old guard, an old school uh, sort of uh, uh, you know ideology around what uh, this idea of a clubhouse or all boys club is about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, Black Chambers really uh, came as a radical transformation of what that should be. Um, mm -hmm. what, I, what I would encourage the Black Chambers going forward is we now need to have Black technology organizations because what's that going to mean for us is uh, technology is going to be the driver for, uh, for the future. Um, there are some cities already have, um, you know, tech communities or, or tech groups that are, they act like chamber, but they are primarily around just really uh, helping to, to create 
um, you know, exposure for for technology. And, and I think uh, we can have that. Um, you know, we talk about having the Black Wall Street, but, you know, I, I see Black Wall Street as Black prosperity, uh, but I also see Black prosperity as Black technology. And, uh, and I see Black technology as black ownership uh, on the digital plantation, right? And it's it's uh, it's those things combined that would really transform uh, what we are now for for the next generation. Right, and that's great because um, the technology, in, even in the STEM, you know, anything in the STEM area, um, I was I have a nephew who's you know looking at computer science, and I'm a former member, um, and I'm being recruited back now to the professional level for the National Society of Black Engineers. And, um, you know, we are heavy in promoting and stimulating young people in the fields of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I was speaking to my nephew about app development and, and software development for HR firms, for accounting firms, because small businesses need specialized and customized software to drive their business processes. You know, so these are, these are some of the ways in which, you know, we can start to encourage our young people, you know, um, in that direction, you know. And Sister Ronique, um, same thing for you with the uh, Augusta, the Greater Augusta Black Chamber, but as a, as, a, as a Black woman in entrepreneurship, what support do we need to give to our Black-owned uh, female entrepreneurs to ensure that um, we're driving them in a, in a more successful direction or a more successful pathway? Sure. Um... I'm just writing it down so I won't forget. Yes, yes, <laughs> so I won't forget to answer that question. But I want to kind of go back just to the previous question real quick. Yes, the um, comment about it, because I had uh, just a couple things to add. I think um, I'm really big about history so we can know how to build better for mm -hmm. our community. Slavery was all about economics. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times we forget that it was about building the economics in the in the in the in the force you see America as is today with free labor. Mm -hmm. That created the economy in America. And when we begin to understand that, we begin to understand a lot of different things that is happening within our community and what we're still dealing with today. Also, mm -hmm. a lot of buildings for our community as far as Black Wall Street and stuff so is happening right now. It doesn't have to be so advertised and so forth, but if you're connected, you'll realize that a lot of people are building in a lot of different um, places around the United States. So it's actually happening. Uh, we just have to get behind it, begin to get into those rooms and, and continue to do those things. I think some things can be out loud, but some things, quite frankly, need to be quiet for us right. until right. we get the infrastructure up. I'm very big about that. Um, and then fear does play a part into it. You asked that question earlier and I wanted to make sure I addressed that. Yeah. And because people seeing what happened in Black Wall Street, what happened with rezoning, redlining, what happened with the highways getting um, built up in America. When you look at where the highways were put, they was most likely purposely put through um, Black influential neighborhoods where we had high economies. That was done on purpose and intentional. So now that we understand those things and those are the things that can come against us, I love what the um, pastor said. Hopefully I'm getting it right. Um, about making sure that they understand we mean business when it comes to building our economies. Right. Um, so um, not only is the tech space important, but the farming space is important, agriculture, the health space, what we put into our bodies, um, and even the psychology space. What we're talking about is a 400 year trajectory that our people, 400 plus years, sorry, trajectory that our people have been through. Mm -hmm. We cannot ignore the mental course of it, the spirituality. We are spiritual people, but we can't understand. We have to begin to address all those things all around. Technology is a huge part, but the basics are even huger. And I and I will always fight for that because I know when I talk to a person that's healthy, that's mentally healthy, that's 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 exercising, that has a balanced diet, et cetera, I can get them to achieve things that is remarkable than I can a person that may be putting the wrong things in their food, may be listening to the wrong things constantly on their feed, et cetera. So we cannot ignore those things. And that is so critical for our community to build. Um, support for black women. Um I think there's a lot of support out there for us. What I don't see is a lot of support for our Black male entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a lot of grants and everything, 
um, for Black women, for sure, um, here since, you know, the Black women became the highest, uh, I want to say the highest, newest entrepreneurs here in the last four or five years. Also the highest um, graduates from um, college here. I think it was in the last three or four or five years as well. So we're hitting a lot of high numbers, but then we have a space of, again, new entrepreneurs who need assistance, access to capital, who need training, who need guidance, who need mentorship. Um, of course, I'm very, uh, very uh, 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 inclusive when it comes to men and women. Because I've, I've seen those grants and everything really come out tremendously for our women, but not so quite for our men. And we talk about generational wealth. We have to remember it's the family structure that builds generational wealth. Yeah. Mr. Villa pointed out that that family in California, as they fought to get their land back, four generations missed out on benefiting off of it. Yes. That was intentional. Yes. The, the thing that we, that's why I go back to our history and our systematic things, the things that um, are done purposely for us is to make sure we, we are pulled apart constantly, whether it be the fight between the man and women, maybe be the fight between a family, maybe it's the trust issues, whatever it is, but a lot of things you'll see that kind of trend is <laughs> sometimes intentionally to keep making sure we keep pulling apart. The difference between us and other cultures is they have not had that trajectory of having systematic media, and I'm yeah. talking about high level media that constantly is putting out um, imagery, messaging to keep us apart or even setting up things that can sometimes pull us apart so we don't depend on each other. Right. So when you begin to understand that overall structure and we're all still understanding, I'm still learning it, but when you begin to understand those unique pieces, you mm -hmm. then can intentionally begin to battle against it, you know, right. and understand that, yeah, I, I am a, single woman who can do things, but I also know the importance of my community, the importance of having a support system, under the importance of relationship, I understand the importance of family. I will never discount any of that. Yes. I will never be that strong. I, I don't like that term, strong black woman. You will no. never hear me call myself that. A lot no. of people will say that about me, but I will always go back to them and say, don't put that over us because what is critical is that we get supported as women that we're able to do everything that we are doing, but also be able to have a balance within our lives or whatever that may be and look like for us. So right. I think it's very critical when we talk about generational wealth and so forth and building what we can for the economy that it's a true ecosystem. It's not one piece is bigger than the other, but it's all those pieces that is very critical. Right. And so. it's, it's important that you, you said, um, you, you always, you leverage everything from history because they say, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. And if we study history, if we understand these historical accounts and how they're connected to the, to the constant you know, oppression of, of black economics, then you understand why it's happening and how you can overcome that, how we can be bold and intentional to create more black Wall Streets and not just to have uh, a representation in Stonecrest, but to replicate that all throughout you know, our communities. You know? Uh, somebody was going to say something. Well, if if you don't mind, I, I I'd like to, to follow up on something that R Ronit yeah. said. Uh, in 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 2020, the the Minority Business Development Agency offered three one million dollar grants in the United States mm. for organizations that would help minority business women. Okay, we 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 took the idea to to one of our clients who was teaching classes, and they said, well. You know, there's only three opportunities, so we'll, mm -hmm. we'll pass. Mm -hmm. Then we took the idea to the Honolulu uh, YWCA, and they said, three chances, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing about fear that, that, that was mentioned earlier is, is about, about having the, the courage to do something like that. The, the Minority Business Development Agency wind, wound up giving out five $1 million grants. And we, we wrote the curriculum for the YWCA and they were one of the five that got, they got funded, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so, uh, and yet, you know, I mean, again, we, we, we do grant writing for a living. I, I don't, I haven't seen anything comparable to that program for men, you know, going back to Ronique's point, you know, this mm -hmm. was to help minority business women. Mm -hmm. It was a million dollars over two years, you know, mm -hmm. and, 
I haven't seen anything like that to help my minority men. Uh -huh. Okay. And then, and maybe there's, there's some, you know, some grants and, and assistance coming down the pipeline, but we'll definitely, you know, um, look out for what we can do in order to, as we, as we continue to be servants of our various communities, Absolutely. you know? All right. So we got about 20 minutes left, right? I, 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 I have enjoyed this discussion immensely. What I want to do is to involve our attendees. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask a question to any one of the panelists or myself, and we will definitely um, welcome your question. Before, before you do that, I want to recognize Mr. Philip Saxton, who is on the call. Um, he is the founder and director of um, Business, uh, Business Samaritans, if I'm, if I'm not um, mistaken. I just want him to, tell, to, to, to just basically tell us a little bit about what he does with his group, um, um, with the Samaritans group. Are we not, we're not hearing you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, I founded Small Business Samaritans actually probably about 10 years ago now. Uh, we have Zoom meetings like this every Friday at eight o'clock from eight to nine. And uh, the purpose is to network, but also to learn and support one another. Uh, I also founded another networking organization called the Decula Business Association that operates in the Decula Business Gwinnett County area. Uh, I am uh, passionate about helping small businesses grow and helping them add jobs and grow their revenue. That's what I'm all about. I spend 90% of my day thinking about that. Uh, last year, I was able to help 146 people find jobs in the businesses that I consulted with. So I'm a, it's, it's, it's a proud accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And every year, that's the way I measure myself. How many jobs have I created in small businesses? That's the way I, I measure myself. Uh, but I've enjoyed tonight, I mean, the, the comments that that you guys have made have been absolutely wonderful. You've given uh, given us a lot of food for thought. And, um, you know, I, I hope that you keep this up. I think that we need to have discussions like this and spread the word and make sure that we have even a larger audience because the words of wisdom that I heard tonight from you guys were absolutely invaluable. and. I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Austin, for putting this on. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. And any any one of these individuals on the panel would be an excellent interjection into your conversations and discussions that you have with Small Business Samaritans. So definitely, you know, I think they put their contact information in the chat. So definitely feel free to reach out to them. You yeah. know, thank you. And I also met uh, Mr. Saxon at the Lona Gallery, as I did with Dr. Gray. The Lona Gallery, you know, is a, a black was a black owned um, uh, art gallery in downtown Lawrenceville, uh, but um, they were they were priced out due to rent hikes. So they they actually had to close their bricks and mortar. But I think they're doing stuff online now, you know. So at, at this point, I, I, is there anyone on on the call who wants to ask a question? This is your time to un, unmute your mic and ask a question to any one of our panelists, because we want to actually include you in the discussion as well. Anyone? Um, yes, this is uh, Pam Mackin Smith, the coolest nerd ever. Um, I have a question for Ricardo. Uh, being that you're in the tech space, um, I just started my business maybe a year ago, and I've, I've noticed that several of my clients um, are not necessarily, I'm sorry, I do web design and data analytics, uh, just to give a, a short little background. But um, I noticed uh, the website portion, completely fine, but when it comes to explaining the importance of data analytics, it's almost like it's over everyone's head. And um, one of the things that drives me with my company is that I do want Black businesses to be able to succeed 
I do want them to get more money. I want them to grow. And the fact of the matter is, I do not believe that can happen um, better without having um, taken advantage of analytics. So I'm just curious, um, you know, just being that you've been doing this for a very long time and I've only been doing it for a year now, any suggestion as far as um, more so just educating my clients and kind of just getting it across to them how, um, how beneficial, how important it is um, to just have that knowledge of the health of your business. Like to me, if you're not looking at it from those aspects, you're, you're blind in a lot of things and I'm sure you'd agree to that. So yeah, just some type of suggestion on um, how to get through uh, to these businesses about the importance of um, tech and analytics uh, when it comes to their own business. Yeah, well, I've, uh, Pam, it's, it, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if we'll have enough time to to explain some of these, um, um, you know, I, I suppose ways that we can help. But certainly, um, we can always talk, uh, of course, off of air and uh, see how we can uh, we can contribute there. But one thing that I'll say, you are absolutely right. Um, again, going back to education. Uh, almost nine out of 10 of our business uh, or people do not understand data, um, do not understand data analytics, do not understand how do we aggregate this data? Uh, how do we visualize it and, and how do we interpret? I think uh, where we are in the data analytics space, we've gotten very well in aggregating it. We can source it from different spaces based on our activities digitally and in, in, in some cases offline as well. We've gotten good at visualizing it. I mean, we've got some of the coolest dashboards that are out there. Uh, some of them are open source. I mean, Google Data Studio, for example, has uh, created uh, an environment to do that and, and private dashboards that are available. I think where we have the challenge is interpreting that data that we're looking at and um, crafting strategies to grow from the data interpretation. So I think those two points are where we still have a lot of opportunity uh, to be able to help each other when it comes to data analytics, because you're going to need uh, to, to do a little more than just the pretty charts and just the pretty graphs and so forth. You're going to need to understand what is actually that, what does that actually mean in layman terms, in simple terms? What do we actually need to do? Uh, because I kid you not, the very activity that we're on right now is generating data. And it's telling right. us something about what we need to do uh, to be able to um, amplify if it's working and modify when it's not working. And that's our mantra, even in our company, uh, we, we don't like to do anything that we don't, we can't measure because obviously we know the saying that if you can't uh, measure it, you shouldn't do it at all. But if you find yourself doing things that can be measured, you really have to get to that place where you can interpret what the data is telling you, because we get lost in that interpretation and we don't do anything uh, with the data, we don't make any moves, we don't create any strategy, and that's where we uh, we we run into challenges. So that would be my suggestion. Uh, if you can own in on the interpretation piece, I think you'd add significant value to your community. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mr. Thompson, Austin. Ms. Maxine, Ms. Yes. Maxine Barnett, yes. Maxine Barnett, founder of Soft Skill Services. I'm an executive and career coach, and I help leaders and business owners navigate the business space or work space, help them to amplify their soft skills because the soft skills is where, in terms of the relationship building, that is where, that is where it matters. And um, no matter how we have the hard technical skills, if we don't have those relational skills to build relationships with our customers, we can lose them with our customers and with each other. My question comes um, most likely to Ms. West. Uh, early in the discussion, um, she mentioned the issue of trust in terms of how we, you know, how we, we navigate and how we interact with our, um, supporting our, our fellow business owners. And my question is, how can we you know, we, we, we seem to know what, what, what is the reason for the mistrust, but we haven't seemed to wrap our hands around how we can get around that and how we can change that. 
That's one. And the other is in terms of ensuring that um, young people see, see leaders and business owners that look like them, how much of that we should be doing. I am from Trinidad and Tobago, and I grew up seeing people in government and people in office like Mr. Thompson. I grew up seeing them looking like me. But I know for a fact that in the United States that there are some children who don't get an opportunity to see that. So it's a two-part question I'm asking. I'm asking about the trust issue, how we get around that, and then how we can ensure that young people get a chance to see people looking like them building businesses. Thank you for the uh, question. Um, so for sure, trust issues. I, I think with trust, um, honestly, I would say that our younger generations, to me, is actually starting to address it. But what I'm seeing in our Gen Z and our millennials, they are pulling together um, back to what I've seen in history. Um, and they're getting through those trust issues. I think sometimes in like my generation, which is Gen, uh, Gen X and then older, I still see that kind of happening. Um, but I do see a, a group of us, even if they're different groups, they are coming together, they are fighting through that trust, but when it comes to trust, you have to first trust yourself. So it always starts with the individual. I think the spirituality part of it, whatever your religion is, I don't wanna force my religion on anybody, but that spirituality part of it is very critical. Then you have, to, you have to first address your own self trauma. What created you not to maybe not trust yourself? Maybe it's the media. Maybe it's something you experienced in your childhood. Maybe it's something that you went through or experienced with a teacher. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it was a business owner, whatever it may be. And some you have to be, it's almost like an intentional portion. You have to begin to do to take actions differently on a regular basis. That's why I suggested like, look at the products you use on a monthly basis, intentionally switch out that product with a black owned company it's intentionally awesome. do things it it, it, it it doesn't have to be i think somebody did a calculation it doesn't have to be a hundred percent of our income but if all of us start taking ten percent of our income talking about the black people that are in the diaspora that are in america whatever whatever your background may be it will shift our economy and like really begin to intentionally ensure that happens and then with that trust just start saying i trust my black people i trust us and understand that individual um, thing that you may have doesn't mean that I didn't have a bad experience with a black business owner. Doesn't mean I didn't have experience with a, a, a bad, bad experience with a black, whatever it may be. I just know that was that individual. I'm not gonna put that blanket statement on all of us. That is something I have to hold myself accountable to. Just like I may have a bad experience at Walmart. Mm -hmm. I, did I stop going to all the Walmarts? Right. You know, so I think you have to begin to question what, are you doing as an individual? And then that will get to the collective. But I am seeing that actually being addressed from the, from my viewpoint, what really I do see. People. So sure. I will say that. And then um, you've seen representations. Interesting you brought that up. National Entrepreneurship Week was actually this past week. We went into the school systems here. So we visited about six school systems, six schools within our system. Um, I've had a meeting with the superintendent of schools. Um, we're working with their CTAE group now um, looking to see how can they begin to see us represented in a way that they need to. Um, I even told them, I know COVID pandemic, I said, but we have we have Zoom. I was like, there's no reason why we can't get in front of our kids and they can't see us. And it, it was so critical. It really was eye opening to me because I realized I used to work with the youth a long time ago when I was in Indiana a lot and I had got away and like really been building infrastructure for our adults. But it really made me realize we have to get back into our youth. I know one of our chamber members is on here or she was on here earlier, Georgia. She went into the schools with us too. So we took business owners into the schools um, and they talked to the youth. And when I tell you it was just very eye-opening for our youth, I think we have to set up those programs to constantly be in, in part of it. And then really, um, I know the um, I know one of the um, panelists said something about making sure we're training up our youth from early on that they're seeing us in entrepreneurship and business ownership and that we have that track 
you know, even with the professionals, for them to see the professional side of us, us represented in all those areas. I grew up in Indiana, so we had a lot of resources there. It's different than in the South, what I'm learning, what I'm seeing. So um, it, it's it's interesting to see the different dynamic. Um, but, it, but it really opens up the eyes. I know when you said, oh my God, they really care. So that, that stood out to me, you know, just from us coming to talk to them. And we had, we had like fair pay, some of the business owners brought fair pays, you know, we had book bags and stuff for the youth, but just for them to see it and realize it's a real thing is important. Even for me to see things like, you. even if you think as an adult, it's important for us to see it too. Absolutely. So, yeah, there you go. Thank you for your response. And, and in both instances, it must be intentional. Yeah. <laughs> so when you want to change out your products, you drive a little further down and support the black, yes. the black store that's a little further down the road. Yeah. Oh, wait on shipping. Wait on shipping. Order your product early. If it's something you want, we will wait. We will right. wait. We will get that product. We'll buy that, whatever it may be. You have to begin to be intentional. And then it becomes a habit. And it becomes a, the only reason why I say you have to do intentional things, because until it becomes something that you just uh, become a habit, you have to first get intentional. What does that change? You got to do something consistent constantly before it becomes, you know, normal. So yeah. that's what I would say. Thank yes, you. Definitely. Can can can, so can, can 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 I can I chime okay. in? I, yes, I, thought, I knew yes, I was going to come in. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 I thought that was great, uh, Sister West. If I if I can chime in, I think what we can also do, if we if we're going to if we see a particular business that we want to do business with, and for some reason they're not acting up to par, mm -hmm. but we want to do business, I think it behooves us to have a conversation with the owner. Yeah. But ha but have it in such a nice way, you know, class example, I have a beard and, you know, one of my barbers, you know, he was kind of lax one time, you know, really upset me. So I was really torn, like, do I really go back to this barber again? Because I mean, you know, he, I, mean, I hate to use the word, he pissed me off because I had set an appointment, he was like an hour late. Mm -hmm. And so I just walked out. So you know, when I went back to him, you know, a while back, I had a conversation with him. I said, look, man, we, you know, I came to you because, you know, you're supposed to be the best, but I set an appointment with you. Mm -hmm. And we had a dialogue for five minutes. Mm -hmm. He apologized. He kind of said, look, man, I'm sorry. So, you know, we, we kind of, we kind of eased everything over, but I, but I, but I was very clear. My time is important. Absolutely. If you tell me you take appointments, if I set an appointment at, at 10, I understand things happen. But I'm not waiting an hour for you. Yes. I'll wait 10 yeah. to 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm not waiting an hour because you got other people in line. Yes. You know, you know, and yes. I told him, you know, let's talk, let's look at your business practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I will wait an hour. Coaching. He got some free coaching from you. He, he got free coaching. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> I, you know, if you're not taking appointments, I can understand. But if you tell me you're by appointment only. So you. we had that, we had, we had that dialogue. And I think what happens is that, you know, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, too many people, you know, we're quick to dismiss black owned businesses when, when, when they, when they feel the first time, you know, if they're late opening up, but if we like somebody, I think, you know, you know, it's incumbent upon us. Look, let's have a conversation. Look, if you say you go open up at 12, Hey, look, I was waiting for you at 12, you know, what it's happened? Five minutes you, before 12. You That's know, or, 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 or something behind it. And I think, you know, it just lets people know, look, I want to send people to you and I want to do business with you, but I got to make sure you're going to be consistent. You know, I can't operate on CPT time, you know, CP time. You know, if you open, if you say open at 12, but you're not going to show up to 1230, we got a problem. Yeah. Change your hours or you yeah. will be out of business. Yeah. And it's not, it's not that people won't support you. You got to look in the mirror and look at yourself. So that's what I want to throw in. Excellent. Right. And that's the kind of help and support that many businesses, especially small businesses, need because a lot of them don't know those little things. They so, don't. Yeah. So my children tell me, oh, mommy, you give a customer service seminar everywhere you go because I offer that kind of help on the spot. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I think that's important that he said that and, and gave that example because mm -hmm. what we don't allow with each other is grace a lot of times. Mm -hmm. We need to give each other grace mm -hmm. and hold each other, but hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. And it's it's because we've been taught that we have to work harder. We got to be twice as hard. We got to be twice as smart. We have to be. And that is something that I love. The younger generations is challenging. They're like, why do we have to do all that to make sure we get the, you know, what hit, you know, success and this and that. I don't think that's the case. And they're really showing us that doesn't have to be the case. 
So right. that portion of him saying that example was a really great example of showing right. grace but still holding accountable. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you. so much. Thank you. Look, I, man, look, we could we could probably go for another hour, but I know <laughs> everyone has things on their yeah. schedule, and it's it's um like a minute to eight. I I just want to take this time to. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Uh, an immense thanks to our panelists, Dr. St. Clair Gray, Ricardo Barris, Sister Ronique West, Lyndon Jackson, um, uh, Jose Big Poppy. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put we gonna put the big the grande poppy. <laughs> Jose Poppy Villa. Thank you so much. Um, for, for, you know, just um, giving your time. I, I, as consultants, I know personally how much your time is worth. And I thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I thank our attendees for registering and logging on. And thank you for joining us this evening. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a tremendous discussion. This is being recorded. So each and every one of you will receive the link and the password to the recording um, so that you can use it for whatever purposes you need for. Um, also, uh, next month is our is International Women's History Month. Um, and we are pleased to have uh, five distinguished women of which Maxine Barnett is one representing Trinidad and Tobago. And we are celebrating International Women's Month uh, Women's Excellence in Entrepreneurship, a Global Perspective. And we will have um, with us uh, Dr. Gamachirai Mutizo from South Africa. I had the pleasure of meeting her uh, in 2017 in Johannesburg. Dr. Jill, Good excuse me, Jill Goodrich, um, the founder and CEO of the Women's Chamber of Commerce, um, will add a dynamic um, contribution to the discussion. I mentioned uh, Maxine Barnett from Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Karen Ukuvuru, who runs the Brand Factory. Uh, she's a branding and marketing uh, authority in Kampala, Uganda. And uh, Sama Forna King, uh, uh, from representing Sierra Leone. And these are all high powered, empowered women running their own businesses and um, being leaders and representatives for women you know, uh, across the world. So we will have these distinguished women on our panel. Um, the date is March 17th, and I will send this out to each and every one of you, Thursday, March 17th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, it's a morning to afternoon time to accommodate because you know, in Uganda, they're eight hours ahead. In Sierra Leone, they're four hours ahead. In South Africa, they're, they're seven hours ahead. And um, Mix Maxine is about five hours, excuse me, three hours behind us. So I had to find that sweet spot <laughs> to accommodate all these wonderful ladies. Mm -hmm. So um, again, uh, in, in, in being respectful for time, I thank you all so much. Um, I'll do a follow-up after tonight. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, Again, I'll send you the link to the recording and the event for next month. Uh, reach out to our consultants, our panelists who spoke tonight. And with that, I wish everyone a, a wonderful evening. Continue to celebrate our Black history, not just 28 days, but 365 days a year. Yeah. Thank you. May you all be blessed. Thank you thank so much. And thank you, Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have Good a good night. One. Hey, Austin, I've got a workshop tomorrow in case anybody wants to find out more. Just contact me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll Thank talk. you. All right. Thank you.